In this video, we're going to explore topics 4.4 and 4.5, Earth's atmosphere and global wind patterns. Relative to the size of the Earth, the atmosphere is an extremely thin layer of gases that surround the entire planet. Earth's equatorial radius is 6,378 kilometers, yet most of the atmosphere's gases are found within 11 kilometers of the surface of Earth. Although thin, distinct layers of the atmosphere can be identified based on their characteristics. Factors such as Earth's rotation and the temperature of air masses influence atmospheric circulation patterns. Most of Earth's atmosphere, about 78% of it, is nitrogen gas. It, along with the nearly 21% oxygen, makes up over 99% of atmospheric gases. The remaining gases in trace amounts include carbon dioxide, methane, and some noble gases. Water vapor also exists in the atmosphere, but in varying concentrations depending primarily on air temperature. The two major gases in the Earth's atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen, are almost exclusively found at an altitude of 500 kilometers or below. But due to gravity, the atmosphere is much more dense, possessing more molecules of gases, at lower altitudes. 75% of the atmospheric gases are found within the lowermost layer of it. Starting at sea level and moving up, the layers of the atmosphere are the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and the exosphere, not shown in this diagram. The troposphere extends up to a height of about 12 kilometers. Although the temperature decreases as you travel higher in the troposphere, it is still the warmest section of the Earth's atmosphere, contains nearly all atmospheric water vapor, and is the layer where most of Earth's weather occurs. Even the tallest of Earth's mountains are contained within the troposphere, and all commercial air travel takes place within it. The next layer up, the stratosphere, is where the greatest concentration of ozone molecules, O3, can be found. Ozone is responsible for absorbing the incoming, harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The absorption of that UV radiation causes a temperature increase in this layer of the atmosphere the higher up you go. The next layer is the mesosphere. The temperature in this layer follows the same pattern as the troposphere, getting colder with increasing altitude. This is the highest layer where clouds, noctilucent clouds, can form and is also where most incoming meteors burn up. Moving into the thermosphere and exosphere, the temperature in these layers is difficult to describe in a meaningful way. The thermosphere is completely cloudless and has no water in it, but is the layer in which the aurora borealis and aurora australis occur, the northern and southern lights, respectively. It is also the layer in which the International Space Station orbits. The final layer is the exosphere. Molecules here are literally hundreds of kilometers apart, and therefore no longer behave like a typical gas, and particles can escape out into space. This layer also contains most of the satellites that orbit Earth. Since Earth rotates on its axis, that rotation influences the movement of masses of air. The surface of the Earth moves beneath the air that seemingly hovers above it. The Coriolis effect results in a deflection of objects as they travel over a rotating surface. Imagine for a moment that the Earth stopped rotating. We also have to pretend then that none of the life-ending side effects of this stopped rotation would happen. If an object was launched from the North Pole in a perfectly southward direction, it would travel in a straight line, eventually reaching its target that was perfectly due south. But because the Earth does rotate, that object launched from the North Pole will appear as though it curved to the right. 
from the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere, an object would deflect to the left. This deflection, due to the Coriolis effect, causes the atmosphere to move in the same deflected manner. Because of the Coriolis effect and the fact that air masses are warming and rising in some regions, and cooling and falling in others, that produces the wind patterns illustrated in this model. In the equatorial region, the trade winds are the result of a westbound flow of air. Just north or south of the equatorial region, wind patterns called the prevailing westerlies exist. Although these winds are moving to the east, wind flow is described based on where the air is coming from. This explains why the air movement in the polar regions is referred to as the polar easterlies. Let's now take a look at a video produced by the British Meteorological Office that will help to illustrate these atmospheric patterns. As well as being split into three cells, the global circulation pattern is at an angle due to the Earth's rotation. The spin of the Earth induces an apparent motion to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. This is the Coriolis effect. The key to the Coriolis effect lies in the fact that the Earth's surface rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. This is because the Earth is wider at the equator, so it has further to travel in one day. The result of this means that as air moves away from the equator, it doesn't move in a straight line relative to the Earth's surface. Instead, it appears to an observer on the ground to move in a slightly curved direction. But there is no physical force causing this deflection. As the atmosphere rotates with the Earth, it is just due to the air flowing from a region that is moving faster to a region that is moving more slowly. To explain this further, imagine an air parcel as a ball. The ball is thrown from the equator towards a point near the North Pole. Even though it moves in a straight line, the ball will appear to an observer on the ground to curve away and land to the right of its target as the point near the North Pole is moving more slowly and is not caught up. If the ball is now thrown from the North Pole towards a point near the equator, it will again appear to a surface observer to land to the right of its target. But this time it's because the Earth's surface at the equator is moving faster and has moved ahead of the ball. This effect only happens on objects that are in motion. This deflection is a major factor in explaining why winds blow anti-clockwise around low pressure and clockwise around high pressure in the northern hemisphere and vice versa in the southern hemisphere. So when flowing towards the North Pole, air is deflected towards the east. And when traveling southwards back towards the equator, it is deflected westwards. The same overall result occurs in the southern hemisphere. How does this lead to eastwards flowing jet streams and prevailing winds? As air moves away from the equator at the top of the Hadley cells toward higher latitudes, it starts to be deflected by the Coriolis force. Just as a skater spins faster by bringing their arms and legs closer to their bodies, air moving away from the equator speeds up as it gets closer to the Earth's spin axis. This process is known as the conservation of angular momentum. The magnitude of the Coriolis force increases towards the poles. So by the time the air reaches 30 to 40 degrees north or south, it is moving in an eastward direction. This subtropical jet stream occurs high in the atmosphere between 12 to 15 kilometers. It is associated with some of the strongest winds on Earth reaching over 280 miles per hour at times. As this jet sits between the descending branches of the Hadley and Ferrell cells, there is little associated weather. The polar front jet forms in a different way. This jet sits between the rising branches of the polar and Ferrell cells. 
It marks the boundary between cold polar air and warm tropical air known as the polar front. The polar front jet occurs at a height of 11 to 13 kilometers and is primarily the result of the temperature contrast across the polar front. The stronger the temperature contrast across the front, the stronger the jet. So it follows that the polar front jet is stronger in the winter than the summer. Waves or ripples along the jet stream can cause Atlantic depressions to deepen explosively as they are steered towards the UK. Winds at the surface are also subject to deflection from the Coriolis force. The surface flow of the Hadley cells form the persistent trade winds. As air flows towards the equator, it is deflected towards the west in both hemispheres, forming the northeast trade winds in the northern hemisphere and the southeast trade winds in the southern hemisphere. The persistence of these winds allowed sailing ships to cross the Atlantic and opened up trade routes between Europe and America, giving them their name. The surface wind in the feral cells would flow from a southerly direction in the northern hemisphere. But the Coriolis effect causes this wind to be deflected to the right, leading to the prevailing westerly and southwesterly winds often experienced over the UK. This setup is not unique to our planet. Jupiter also has circulation cells similar to those on Earth. The day on Jupiter lasts for about nine and a half hours, so it is rotating much more quickly than the Earth. And thanks to the density and composition of Jupiter's atmosphere, we can very clearly identify the patterns of atmospheric movement resulting from the Coriolis effect. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, take care.